Hi everyone, welcome to Woolen Spinning. This is episode 122 and it is the last one of the summer. I thought last episode would be the last one, but instead we are going to be able to push one more in and have one last one and just eke it out before the end of the summer. So thank you so much for being here and thank you for tuning in. It is Saturday morning. It is the last day of August in 2019. It's August 31st and my name is Rachel. Thank you for being here. Thank you for in being a part of this and uh, welcome to new viewers. I hope you enjoy what you see here and uh, I hope that you enjoy the show. We have an absolutely packed show today because I have some unboxing to do. I thought that I would do it on the show so you can see it down here to my left and um, I thought we would just open some stuff together today because I did have a little bit of an eventful mail week. So without further ado, let's just get into the show and um, get into my projects and get into some chatter. I wanted to make a couple of announcements before we sort of get going and chat is uh, chit chatting and I was here early this morning because we actually just got in late last night from Victoria, British Columbia. I'm in the greater Vancouver area of British Columbia in Canada. So I'm actually quite tired. I've got big bags under my eyes. So I'm sorry for, for that, but um, I actually feel quite good. We, um, I'm just going to tilt my camera here because actually otherwise I look at the monitor and not at the camera. <laughs> Anyways, um, we uh, got in quite late last night and I was getting everything organized for the live stream and whatnot. And um, because we had been away for a couple of days, I actually ended up with a mailbox full of stuff when I returned because I had gotten the notifications while we were away that stuff had come. And then I was looking through everything and uh, I realized that like we've got, actually got quite a big show. So I wanted to make a couple of announcements before we go on, just because if you don't watch the whole show and you miss the housekeeping at the end, you will miss that there are going to be some changes starting um, September 1st. So tonight at midnight to Patreon. I've already kind of made them, but if you see that your Patreon and stuff have, have, has been charged and whatnot and you want to change things around, now is your opportunity. For those who are already pledging at the top tier, you don't have to worry about this if this is something that you are interested in and if this is something that you would like to be a part of. But basically, for the last number of years, if you follow the blog and if you read the blog, um, I, which is wellforpearls.com, and then the patron is well, it's patreon.com slash wellforpearls. So two kind of different sites, but they're both maintained. And I do tend to cross post a little bit when there's stuff to share. Um, I've been talking off and on for a really long time on the podcast and otherwise about a lot of this idea of a capsule wardrobe and the idea of minimizing my environmental footprint around my clothing and a lot of the stuff that I wear I've actually had since I was in university and I graduated from my undergrad in 2004. So a lot of my stuff is actually um, quite like it's starting to get kind of old but I also my style hasn't changed I wear the same stuff my sister-in-law was saying to me the last couple of days she's so funny she's a little bit of a clothes horse but she thrifts everything and we were talking and she's like yeah like every time I see you like I kind of know which outfits you're going to be wearing and I kind of know like how you're going to be dressed she's like you just have like a certain style that you've just kind of always had because I've known her since her and my brother met in like 2008 no when did I get married? I got married in 2007. Oh, that's the other thing. Last weekend was my 12th wedding anniversary. So uh, Mike and I have been together for 13 years, So, which is kind of cool. So she was saying to me that like, um, and I've known her since 2006. So we were talking about it. We were just saying like, when you sort of know how you want to dress and what you find comfortable and not wanting to spend a ton of money on our clothes and like I'm really careful about like in Canada we have this store called Superstore and it's part of the no frills president's choice no name brand kind of conglomerate which are all like Canadian brands but a lot of it's American products and 
I'm really careful when I walk into Superstore to not go to the section where like the Joe Fresh clothing is because that's a Canadian clothing brand. It's all fast fashion. And I used to just pop over there and grab a t-shirt or I'd grab, you know, a tank top or I'd grab a pair of jeans or because everything's like under 40 bucks. And I just started trying to be a little bit more conscious of it because I was finding that like our grocery bills were getting higher and higher because... I was just grabbing the odd thing and it was coming in under groceries and Mike was like, you know, like, is there other stuff on the bill or is there stuff that we need to recategorize and whatnot? And I was like, oh yeah, like, and it just adds up, right? And um, I would like to retire one day. <laughs> and um, so we were talking about it, her and I, and we were sort of trying to figure out like around this whole capsule wardrobe idea here in where her and I live, we don't really have four seasons. The seasons are very similar. So you can have a wardrobe that ebbs and flows throughout the year where you add in your winter jacket or you add in your winter boots for a couple of days, weeks, and then you can take them out again. And so we were kind of talking about that. So to that end, I had also said that by the time Nora or when Nora went to kindergarten, which is next week, that I would pull out my sewing machine and start sewing. And that's been part of the reason why I've got this real bug in my ear about wanting to weave because the whole reason for coming back to sewing was that I wanted to sew with my hand woven fabric. So I've got a couple of projects that I'm thinking about. I've got a couple of, of ideas. I've bought um, a couple of uh, things of cones of 2-8 cotton, uh, cotton actually, organic cotton. So a little bit more expensive, a little bit nicer to work with. And I've got a couple of um, woven shirt ideas that I want to start with to just play around with the idea. And so to that end, we're, I'm going to be starting in just a couple of weeks uh, a new live stream. It's going to happen twice a month. It's going to be on Tuesday mornings for half an hour. And this is all we're going to talk about is building a capsule wardrobe, what it looks like, why you would want to do that, what the different uh, capsule wardrobes might look like if you're say in the northern hemisphere and you really do need four seasons of clothing or if you're down under and you need like say if you're in australia my my cousin was saying she lives in australia for a couple of years and she was saying like because they got like a really real winter she needed her mom to ship her her stuff from toronto for her winter wardrobe and then she shipped it all back and then she needed a lot of stuff that was like true summer clothing that she actually wouldn't have needed if she lived in toronto because Toronto's summers are different anyways we were talking about that so like she needed multiple bathing suits not just one um because they were you know at the beach and in the water multiple times throughout the day and her stuff wasn't dry it's just all that stuff that you think about anyhow not to ramble but that is sort of what we're going to be talking about is like why you would build it what are some of the items that you want to think about how you want to curate your style do you want to have a style do you just want to minimize your global footprint um, the idea of reusing stuff. I, I need to tailor a few things and re recut it, reshape it so that I can keep using it. A couple of my flannel shirts, they're totally fine. They're brand new, but they are so big. Um, so yeah, just talking about some of that stuff. So that's called the wool stream. It's already part of the Patreon tiers and you can go and click on that and join that and you will be able to be a part of that live stream twice a month. If you cannot join the live stream in that day at that time, it will be available for that tier on an ongoing basis. So if you get behind for a couple weeks or a couple months or whatever, it will be there for you when you're ready. So um, I hope that that's something that you guys are um, interested in. I know So Liberated on Instagram. She has her, a pattern line. She's a pattern designer. A couple of the things that I want to add into my wardrobe actually are, front, are her patterns. She does a lot around like capsule wardrobe. So she just did one for travel. And she did it in like a small backpack and she was a bit concerned that it wouldn't be enough. And she came back and she said she actually could have gone with fewer pieces. So it's stuff like that, like reflecting on that, learning from that. I'm really excited. So this is something I've been dreaming about for about seven years. So um, it, that's going to be completely devoted to that. It won't be just spinning. Um, it'll be actually it'll be mostly weaving and sewing. So if that interests you, please have a look over there. Mending is a huge part of it. You're absolutely right, Rebecca. Welcome. Hi, it's good to see you. And uh, vacation wardrobe. So like one of the things that I was thinking about actually was um, like when we go to Toronto, if we go in the summer, like maybe I could actually do what So Liberated did and just take a backpack for me that has nine, nine items in it and just see how it goes and then reflect on that and say like 
you know, did it work, did it not work? What would I switch out? Um, just being really aware of how, you know, buying jeans just to get you through and then throwing them in the donation pile the next season because they don't fit that well. Some of that stuff, I'm I'm really struggling with some of that stuff because a lot of the, that clothing gets burned now because there's so much of it. Um, a friend of mine was saying, you know, there's some, some big, big Canadian clothing retailers like Lululemon and Aritzia and stuff. And uh, when that clothing doesn't sell in the stores, it gets sent back. It gets sent to like, you know, big processing warehouses and stuff and it all gets shredded and burned. So there's companies that are trying to um, get this stuff and they shred it and they use it as batting and like in like upholstery, chairs, cushions, that kind of stuff. But the reality is a lot of this stuff is uh, really affecting our world. So anyhow, there's lots and lots of stuff um, to talk about on that stream and it won't be politically charged and all that kind of stuff in terms of like spending half an hour ranting, raving about the state of our clothing industry and fast fashion and whatnot. But because I, I feel like it's, we have to move forward and, and try to do something. So that's something that I'm just thinking about. I'm probably not going to make jeans. <laughs> I will probably be buying jeans because um, I just don't want to get into a whole bunch of that type of ta really fussy tailoring. So that is something I have been thinking about. Um, chat is really busy, so I'm just going to have a look. Um, you guys are just so awesome. Okay, you guys are looking at the box. The box. Um, this is, I know everybody's getting them, um, but it did come yesterday and they had said it actually wouldn't come until the end of September, but I actually got a shipping notice and it came. So I thought we could open it together. I know a lot of other podcasters have talked about them and shown them on, the, on their um, um, channels and whatnot, but I thought it'd be fun to just open it up together. Reclaiming old textiles used to be an actual job up until the early 20th century and then it went away and now it's coming back. Absolutely, Kelly, you're absolutely right. Um, yeah, I know, Claudia, it's crazy. When there's a gr couple of really great books um, that I can um, post to and link to if you guys are interested in reading more. There's actually one that's, um, is it called The End of Fast Fashion? It's actually a UK book. It's written by a UK uh, journalist. It was really interesting. Um, I didn't agree with everything that she said and some of the stuff was really politically charged because it has to do specifically with the UK and Britain and it's just not, um, it, we've got different issues. Um, but yeah, it was just really interesting. All right. Okay. Yeah. So anyways, I know clothing is a, it's a big thing. It's, there's a lot of layers to it. Um, just the fact that we can sit here and talk about it and, um, um, have these discussions sort of reflects our own, um, privilege for lack of a better word around this stuff that we can even just sort of sit here and have these discussions. And, you know, for some people that's not even an option. Um, you know, some of the clothing and the cheapness of it, it, like it is their only options and stuff. And so I think like, you know, keeping, keeping some of that in mind and just sort of trying to disseminate some of that stuff and trying to break some of that stuff down. It's really, it's, it's really hard work and it's, it, it's really important. Um, and that's actually part of the reason why I'm just trying to somehow consume less and buy less. And, and, um, you know, the stuff that I do want to donate, I'm very, thoughtful about where I donate it and where I send it to because there's more and more like we're in the part of the lower mainland that I live in there's more and more places that are they're selling secondhand clothes so you think you're donating it but then they're turning it around and trying to make a profit and yeah it's tough and I'm very you know there's a lot of like kids clothing that goes through and uh, you know all of that stuff is like you, you know where's it being made who's making it and I love some of the stuff on Instagram there's a hashtag I made your clothes it's a really um educational um you know for some people they've maybe never thought about it so um yeah I I think you know just recognizing that the fact that we can even have these conversations and that we can sort of sit here and say, well, you know, maybe I don't want to be a part of those systems anymore. And just recognizing that we even have a choice um, is really important. If I can't join that tier right now, can I join later? And absolutely, Rebecca. So all of those posts and everything will be available on an ongoing basis. It's like Maker Morning. You can go back in and watch the live streams um, and they'll be in the index. So they'll all be indexed, uh, just like all of our other stuff. And you'll be able to click on the posts and I'll, I'll number them so that they stay in order and you can kind of watch how, how things evolve. Um, 
All right. <laughs> if you're in Mongolia and it's negative 20 and all you have to keep you warm is a fire, clothes burn really hot and for a long time. <laughs> it's true, Megan. Um, all right. All right, <laughs> Claudia. I actually find it very interesting that you know that, LOL. All right. Oh, hi, Julia. Good to see you. Um, anyway, so yeah, we can continue this conversation in that. In, it's called the Wool Stream, and um, we'll, we'll, um, we'll continue that over there because otherwise we're going to derail the whole podcast. So I have some unboxing to do. Do you guys want to do that first, or do you want to talk about projects first? Um I have some weaving to talk about. Um, if you were part of the Maker Morning last weekend, I shared all about my new loom back here, but it's a Leclerc Compact 24. It's a completely random story how I ended up with it. And uh, I gave the Louette Jane back to Jeanette, who I was borrowing it from. She's at Kind Cloth on Instagram, K-I-N-D-K-L-O-T-H. They make her and her partner, um, her business partner they oh my goodness they make beautiful things if you're really into weaving and you want some inspiration go look at their their feed it's amazing um you want you guys want to do a box unboxing okay i've never done an unboxing before so i'm going to switch the cameras around and uh i'm going to turn just a little bit so that uh, i can sort of do this so um i ordered an electric eel wheel and it's the nano if you guys don't know about this spinning wheel and about this company and the kickstarter that they did and all that kind of stuff um i really encourage you to go to dreaming robots uh website and you can sort of find out all about it but it's these little electric spinning wheels that they have um um come up with and there's been mixed reviews online there's been a lot of really positive stuff online um they have little tiny motors in them and I actually so I intentionally tried not to read a lot of the reviews and tried not to sort of engage like look at a lot of that content that's out there about them because I sort of I want to I wanted to um make my own conclusions and then go back and look at what other people had um said about them because I, uh, yeah, I thought that was really important. So I'm going to take the receipt out. And um, these are, these retail for roughly $100 US, roughly. And um, it looks like there's a whole bunch of spin cards. They want you to share one. There's twist angle. And then on the back, um, this is the one to keep. It's got the wraps per inch and your, um, and a ruler, and then on the front, it's your your twist, which way Z twist goes, which way S twist goes, which is just awesome, because that's something that you would keep. And then the one to share has the twist angle on the front, and then it has their, their uh, ad on the back. Yeah, it's dreamingrobots.com. So I'm just gonna put those to the side so I don't lose them. He churned out 5,000 in two weeks. He works super late and seven days a week to get it done. That's amazing. Yeah, I knew. That, so it's funny that you would say that, Claudia, because um, you've obviously been following sort of um, the, the stuff and how they did all of this. Um, I, uh, I, I had kind of, I knew about it and I knew what was going on, but because I've been taking a bit of a social media break for the last few months, um, and just not quite as present online. I sort of knew of it and knew kind of what was going on, but I don't know all of the um, ins and outs of it. It was a Kickstarter project. I think it was funded very, very well. Um, and it's, it, yeah, it's kind of taken off. I mean, it's just been awesome for them. So these are all part of the bobbins. These are all the enders. So there's two, I've got, so I ordered the black and black and white one. This is my, the USB cable. These are more enders to the bobbin. I think that's the um, one of the brake bands. These are all the bobbins. I feel like I need you here, Claudia, so that you can like put this all together for me. Um, yeah, so they just fit together like this. So there's the two ends and they just pop together. That's pretty intuitive as I can't get it together. Um, it just goes like like that. So the bobbins are quite small. I wish I had a bobbin, a, a real bobbin to compare and then you could see could see the difference for those who um, haven't seen these little wheels. 
So there's this white box here. This is the plug. Pretty straightforward. Okay, I'm gonna move this out of the way. These actually are kind of cool, the bobbins, because they're flat packed, right? So the flat pack, like the ability, it's kind of like the uh, Hansen mini spinner. Like to be able to flat pack your bobbins is actually really nice. Um, I think for for a lot of people that that's really great. Yeah, it's true, Kelly. You hear of a lot of horror stories with Kickstarter. Okay, I'm not going to try to put that one together. It's not going together. It's just because I need to fiddle with it. Um, yeah, you do. And you know, it's funny because I almost funded a kick or helped to fund um, a Kickstarter. Um, and I ended up not, um, but it was something in the, um, um, it was something in the, uh, um, it doesn't matter. Anyways, um, and I didn't because I just kind of was like, I wonder if he's really going to do this. So I didn't end up funding. Three years later, he still hasn't written the book. The Kickstarter was a was a success. So he earned like eighty eight thousand dollars U.S. or something. He's written no book. There's been no like drafts. There's been nothing. All he had written was the first like the introduction, kind of um, the foreword, and then he'd written like the first chapter. And there's been nothing else on it. And apparently, he spent all the money, and. Um, there's still no book. So anyways, not good. So I'm, I'm actually glad I didn't fund it, but, um, okay. So this is the little, this is it. So it comes in bubble pack. Oh my goodness gracious. This thing is so freaking cute. <laughs> so I'm just going to put this down at the side of me. I'm going to put this USB cable away. And so it looks like this, the, the cable in here that's in this bag baggie is um, like a spare one because it, it comes all set up already. Oh, that's so cool. Okay, so some of you probably already know this because you've been following this story online. Oh, and it's got the fish at the back. Can you see that? It's got the fish. That's really neat. That's a nice touch. That's a detail that like you don't have to put in if you don't want to. And then there's the fish at the front. That's neat. I like that. That's really cool. That's, that's yeah, attention to detail. Because it could have just been 3D printed there and like nothing. And then you've got your S twist here. Oh, I'll put this up here because then you guys can see. So there's your S and Z. So you really have to know which way you're going. And then there's your speed knob. So, um... Let's see if this thing works. So I don't know if I thought that it would be bigger or smaller. I don't know. I know my friend Marianne got one. She got the purple one. I think she's calling it Betty Lou, Mary Lou, something like that. Anyways, um, it's cute. So I'm gonna plug it in. So this is the, it's a scotch tension. So this is your um, drive band back here. And then you've got your brake band on the front that's on the bobbin. So that's scotch tension. If it was Irish tension, it would be on, um, yeah, so your brake band's on your flyer. And then if, but if it was, if it was Irish, it would be opposite. So your drive band would be on the bobbin and your brake band would be on the flyer. But, um, this is scotch. It's kind of neat how they've done it. So it's, it's basically like a hair tie, a plastic hair tie. And then you, he's got slits here and you put, put your hair tie in the slits. So I'm just going to take off the brake for now and just leave it really loose. I have to plug this in, so just one sec. Um, if you go to an, if you go on Eel Wheel Facebook page, they are modifying brake bands with beads and some springs to make it work better for them. Um, I had seen that on Instagram, Claudia. Oh, 
Okay, so it's plugged in. Do you think people have um, really uh, needed that or wanted that? Like, do you think that's been like kind of a big thing? Okay, I'm gonna trap this feed. Well, that's cute. Huh. <laughs> Let's move it over so you guys can see it. That's really fun. So I've got it right now. It's just over halfway in terms of speed. So if I turn it down, that's slow. It's not super quiet. That's not too bad, but it's spinning really slowly. Let's max it out. Wow, that's cool. Does it get quieter, Claudia, as you load it? Have you read anything about that? Huh. That is cool. This is the orifice hook here. So this little, little dubamahickey goes in here to thread your, or sorry, I got it backwards. Silly, silly me. Um, it goes in here. And then that's your orifice right there. So you can see where that, that comes through there. And I know I saw a bunch of hacks on Instagram and then it's held on by magnets, which is just brilliant. That is really cool. I love that idea. I would love to see other wheel makers do that. Um, that's really neat. Hmm. That is very cool. So you've got your drive band up here across the front, like a sort of a traditional, like my, my Lundrum is built like that. The, um, the drive band is at the front. And of course you don't have all the ratios and anything, everything. You just have like one, this is because it within e-spinner, you don't need different ratios. You have your speed and your speed becomes your, becomes your, um, you know, adding more twist, less twist, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then your brake band is at the back. So that is really cool. Huh? And then you've got your, your hooks here that, do they squeeze? Yeah, they squeeze. Hmm. That's cool. And then I've seen a lot of people, you see how it's got these down here? Um, I've seen a lot of people have, um, um, nail them to, it down onto a um, piece of wood. So like a piece of um, plywood like this and they, they clamp it, they um, you know nail it down onto something so that it doesn't move around. That's cool. It makes a cute swooshing, swooshing sound, swooshing sound. Yeah, it does. I'm gonna move the microphone so you guys can really hear it. So I'm talking at like a, a little bit louder than I normally talk. I'm actually not a very loud talker which is why we had to adjust the sound on the podcast. Um, but I'll just put the microphone right here. I'm gonna show you guys what I'm doing. You're gonna see my workspace a little bit here. So let me just move the, the camera just a tiny bit. So here's, okay, so I wonder if I put, okay, let's try a couple things. I'm, I'm curious about this. Okay, so this is gonna roll. Okay, so this is the sound that it's gonna make. I don't know if you guys can hear me. Oh, it's quieter when I put a mat underneath it. Huh. So this is just a hand woven, one of those Zulum things. My friend Debbie made it for me. I have a whole set of them from her. It's quieter when you put something underneath it. It absorbs some of the motor noise. Hmm. That's cool. So I got the black one. I didn't really want to get purple because it's not like my color. Um, I'm not like a big, um, um, like it's just not my... Oh, here, let me change the mic. Let me move the mic first. Um, I didn't get the purple one because um, I, uh, I don't know. I, the, some of those colors are like, they're just not, they're not colors I tend to wear. Um, 
I tend to sort of like the neutrals a lot and I sort of thought because it comes with the green and the purple bobbins I sort of thought that like that was kind of fun because I have those pinky purple bobbins for my magic craft that I use all the time and um and then I have the the black e-spinner because I kind of thought you know what I actually thought was probably over time what's going to happen is on the side here you're probably over time going to end up with like a sticker there you know or something um just because I think you know we sort of make our stuff our own and that's kind of what happens so anyways I'm going to unplug this and I'm going to move it out of the way because we do need to move on with the podcast because it's already 8 30 but that's kind of fun hey um, okay, let's do the other unboxing because this is completely, so we're, we're turning left, pivoting a little bit. Where did I put it? Okay, so I got this package in the mail. Is it that metal bit at the front that's making the noise? Yeah, you know what? I think it is. I think it's in here. It's this in here that kind of makes a bit of noise. And then it's also the motor, the motor, um, makes a bit of a noise because it's what it looks like underneath. So I know some people, I know there's been a couple of people on Instagram who said the motor burned out almost right away. And it makes me wonder if they were running it like at top speed. Cause I know like with the handsome mini spinners, um, when I first got mine and they've changed since I had mine and since I sold mine, um, that was something that was an issue. Um, I'm just going to cut this open. Um, the motors would burn out because people were running them at like top speed for multiple hours. Um, I know a couple of people said about the great for long car rides. It doesn't have a plug for the cigarette lighter or anything. So, but I think you could totally do a hack or get a battery or whatever. Um, so I think that would be really cool. Um, I don't know if I'll take it or not because I don't tend to spin a lot when I'm away. Um, I do take my spindles. I tend to use the time for knitting, but maybe that'll change if I can take something like that. Cause we have a, um, we have an adapter in our trailer too. So I could actually plug it in if we're getting full sun and our sun and our, um, our solar panels are getting charged. Um, I could actually use it. Um, oh, a mouse pad would work really well. You're yeah. And it would be non-slip here. Let's try that. You guys have such great ideas. We may not end up talking about anything else on this podcast episode today. Um, we're all having fun with this. Did everybody know about these? Like in the chat, did you guys all know about these? <clears throat> I'm just curious. Nope, doesn't absorb the sound. No, it actually is exactly the same. woolen spinning oh, it absorbs it a little bit it's not as good as the as the, the fabric I don't know. <clears throat> anyhow we could talk about this all, all day so I will talk about it over the course of like as I use it and as I am um, troubleshoot it and figure things out and I'm not I don't I don't um I don't actually use Facebook at all I pretty much don't don't go on Facebook ever um but maybe I'll go on and look at the electric eel um the electric eel uh Facebook page okay so this is completely random so this has to do with what's behind me this is from lofty fiber and I don't I don't know anything about them it just came up on my thing but I have to say their customer service was excellent I ordered this it shipped I ordered this at like 10 o'clock at night and it shipped at 6 a.m. the next day came from the states it's 3d printed maybe some of you know what this is for the lumen behind me. So 
So I ordered four pieces because each piece is six inches long. I've seen these pop up on Instagram, yeah. Oh, awesome, Alberto. Yeah, I, I'll let you guys know. No, you guys didn't know about them. Oh, cool. Oh, I'm glad then because that's really cool because then it's something that, you know, I can share with you guys and then you'll sort of, when you see them, I'm just putting, I'm snapping these together so that this is how long this thing is. So this goes in like that and then you snap it together like that. A rattle. <laughs> I knew Charlotte would get it. When I saw Charlotte come into the uh, chat this morning, I was like, oh, thank goodness, because she'll know exactly what this is. And if Erica was here, she would have known as well. Oh, and Eve knew. I, I'm not surprised that Eve knew. So this is a rattle. So it's a 3D printed rattle. And then I got some enders for it because um, I just wanted it to look finished. So the enders look like this. And it just pops on like this. And it just finishes it off so that you could actually, if this doesn't fit on the loom behind me, although now that I've put it on, I probably will never get it off. Okay, well, I'll just leave it on. Um, you could actually probably just um, um, cut this off. Like you could probably just shave this, this off right in here. So actually, depending on how this looks and depending on how this kind of comes together, if you will, I might do that because this end is fine, but they give you the end piece or you order the end pieces. I think this thing in total because of shipping cost me like 30 bucks Canadian. Um, but like the rattle to get the rattle that goes with this loom. So LeClaire, let me move the camera around just a little bit. So I'm going to move the, uh, this is going to be a little bit maker morning ish for just a minute. Um, and, um, then you guys can see what I'm talking about. Okay. So this is the 24 inch compact. So what LeClaire wants you to do is they want you to take the, so this is a floor loom. It's a 24 inch loom. It's a Jack loom. Um, it's very, very similar to the baby wolf. Um, the shacked, um, the shacked looms, um, but it's 24 inches instead of 26 weaving width. I mean, um, I think it's when I measured it, I think it was, um, 27 inches wide, I think. And it folds up, it scissors up into, uh, to be a sword against the wall. So what LeClaire wants you to do is they want you to take the beater apart and take this piece off. I feel like a teacher right now. And um, they want you to take the, the reed out and they want you to put the rattle in here. And then you can use this that goes on top of the, the reed on top of the rattle to keep your yarns that you've put through here on your rattle in place it, just because you don't want them to pop out the top. Whereas Louette has very shallow rattles. So the Louette rattles are like this high. They're just tiny. And they want you to just put a piece of cotton or string or yarn or whatever. Yarn can break if it's, if it's weak um, over top and just cinch it down and hold it in place while you um, wind on your warp and you can um, wind on over top. So you go over top of the loom and the Louette looms are set up slightly differently from some of these Jack looms, even though they're all, they're all um, rising shed looms. So um, your shed comes up when you uh, pull the, if it's a hand, if it's a table loom and you're doing it by hand, or if it's a floor loom like this and you're doing it by foot, your, your, your shed, your threads rise. Um, so with Louette, you kind of go up and over and they put the, they always put the rattles up top on the top of their looms. And, um, the, the thing is LeClaire just wants you, they either, LeClaire wants you to sectionally warp in an ideal world. They want all of their looms to be sectionally warped. So even this loom comes with a sectional beam that you can add on at the back that are one inch increments um 
But the cool thing about these 3D printed rattles is that like the Louette rattle, it can go above and on top of the loom and then you can either take it off or you can leave it. Um, and I like these ones a little bit better than the Louette ones because the, the, the teeth are higher. So you could theoretically put more, not that you're putting more threads in because you're still warping up the same stuff. It's just that the threads aren't so likely to jump, pop out the top because that happened to me every single warp that I spread on the rattle on the Louette loom, every single time I had threads pop out. And so I think that's why people are making these 3D printed ones just deeper. And then you still have to use a piece of cotton or string or whatever to secure it up top. And over time, I'll have some videos of like what that looks like and how I do that. Um, yeah, so it's kind of neat because there are rattles out there that like that are quite expensive that you can get that are like metal tines that kind of look like a hackle and they have a cap for it and you put a cap on top. Um, very like a la Magicraft kind of idea. So what the plan is with this, I'm going to stand up and move a little bit. And I'll, I'm, the sound is going to change a little bit because I'm not going to be right by my mic, but you should still be able to hear me. Um, basically what this is going to, where this is going to go. This loom is a for now, for later loom. So right now I have four shafts in this loom, but you can add four back here. So that's why there's this gap back here on the back part of the loom. So I have four shafts, one, two, three, four, and then I can add four and it's all already in place to do that. So the woman that I bought this from, and she gave it to me for a steal, um, she uh, she's moving, she needed to get rid of it. She's never used it. I put the first warp on it that's ever been on. Um, she, uh, that was her plan, was to add four later. So it means I have access to an eight shaft loom because Jack out in the living room, my big floor loom, 45 inch loom is only four shafts. So it means that I do have access to an eight shaft loom if I want it um, because I probably won't be getting another floor loom, another 45 inch floor loom for a very long time if I have access to being able to do some of these patterns. And the reality is most of the patterning and stuff that I wanna make and wanna do, um, I only need four shafts. So a lot of them actually only need two or three. So um, so what I'm going to do with this, yeah, you can put rubber bands over top for sure. That doesn't work with um, some of the wool because it sticks to it because I tried that. Um, but basically, this is going to go up here. So what my plan is, This room is actually really dark. So as soon as I started weaving, so as soon as I started weaving in here, I realized that it was really, really, really dark. And um, I started having to figure out lighting issues because um, yeah, it's just a really dark room. So this is going to go up here. So I'm either going to glue this up here or um, I'm going to get some little tiny C clamps and clamp it up here and just clamp it on when I need it and take it off when I don't need it. Because the thing is, is like if I don't, it fits on here perfectly. And even with four extra shafts here, the shafts will still be able to move freely um, because it sits on, on back here. Um, and so that's how I warped up the loom the other day. Um, I used, I used a, one of my sectional beams actually, which was a total and complete hack and I wouldn't recommend it, but it worked because of the project that I was doing, which I'll talk about later in the show. But, um, that's why I'm going to have to clamp it on. I'm going to have to like, I can, I'm not going to be able to just like sit it up there. Oh, and if you drop it, it comes on, on comes apart. The other thing too is that with this, if I don't leave it up here permanently, um, I can I can keep it in my weaving bag I, to take it apart. So that would be kind of neat. So I can leave it in my bag um, apart and uh, see all my cables and all my cords and all the stuff that it takes to 
have a podcast. It's crazy. Um, don't get me wrong. I love doing it. Love it. So anyway, so I could leave it like, um, I could take all these apart and I could just leave it in a bag, um, when I'm, when I don't need it. Cause you're not putting on a warp all the time. And then I wouldn't be, um, altering the loom at all. If I were to ever sell it. And then if I want to sectionally warp, um, big pieces of fabric for, uh, weaving to make fabric to sew with and to make clothing and whatnot, um, I'm going to use my other loom. So yeah, so that was the other thing that I got. All right. That's a lot of unboxing for one day. <laughs> We've never done an unboxing before. It's kind of fun. Cause I don't buy very much stuff. And then when I do, I'm like, Oh, so exciting. Um, so it's really fun. Well, we usually do like a reveal if I buy, if there's a big fiber festival and I bought, and I bought some fiber and stuff. So it's not like we don't ever do anything, but all right. Okay. I haven't been watching the chat because I, um, because I, uh, was over there. So let me just catch up with chat. Um, someone will fall in injury. Mm, that's cool. Keep it on the floor nails facing the walls. I don't want, yeah, that's probably a good idea, Alberto. Um, looks great. The only option I came up with is to have. Yeah. I, th I thought about the hammer thing. Cause like Mike could totally do that for me. It'd be super simple, but, um, a couple of, the rattle handmade rattles that I've seen, um, when the nails pop up, the wood around it, um, can splinter a little bit. And then when you're really, really, really super fine threads are running over it, they catch. And so I just thought, you know what? I came across it on a Ravelry search and I thought, you know what? Worst case scenario, it's a terrible product. And I tell you guys that, and then you don't go out and spend 30 or $40 and get a, one of these and end up really not liking it. So I sort of thought like, at least it's an opportunity for me to tell you about something that I stumbled on that's uh, got a lot of a lot of potential. So, and based on what I've seen so far, that's definitely not the case. I think it's going to work out really well. Um, yeah, you're right, uh, Charlotte. Graduate from a weaving bag very quickly. Yeah, I'm probably going to end up sexually warping most things. I think that's really what's going to happen because um, you know, there's a great. Uh, it doesn't have any any voices or any talking, but there's a great video uh that leclerc has on their website about sexually warping and it he he goes through it and does it all and megan and i've been chatting on the slack channel about sexually warping and stuff and like there's a lot of benefits to it i just don't want to get into that rut where that's the only way i warp or that's the only way i know how to warp i think it's really good to know different different methods and laura fry talks about that in her book like you know, do what works in that situation and have an arsenal full of lots of different skills that you know how to do so that you have skills to draw on for different situations. Like I don't really want to wind on a 45 inch wide, 32 ends per inch warp onto the jack. Like I would rather sexually warp that. So let's talk about yarn. Um, I'm just going to grab my, my uh, notes here. So this... I'm going to skip works in progress and we'll come back to that in just a sec because I put this up. Um, this was a spin that I've been working on for quite a long time and I started it back in June in the June maker morning and this was the Smith and You uh, Polworth, um, Polworth and Silk uh, spin that I had done. So I, I plied it. So I got, I had it spun and then I got it plied and unfortunately the camera is not going to give you like this really amazing uh, view of it. But um it's a fine three ply. It came up as a light fingering. So even after washing, it didn't poof up like I thought that it would. Like not to the, excuse me, not to the extent that like a two ply normally would, but this is a three ply and it's really tightly spun. So um, I'm really, I just want the camera to focus. I'm 
really, really, really happy with how this turned out. The colors blended really beautifully. There's the gold in there, but it's not completely lost. Um, but it acts as a neutral because it potentiates the green and makes the green really come out. On the screen, it's actually showing up more saturated than it is in real life. So in real life, it, it's more like this. It's quite gray. Um, but when you look at it, you can still see the mauvey purple. You can see the gold. And then, of course, you can see that beautiful gray green that's in there that's coming up for you a bit more turquoise. Um, but yeah, it turned out really well. Very, very fine spin. I spun all of the singles to one bobbin. I think I talked about that on the show. And so I spun them all to one bobbin and then I wound them off onto weaving bobbins so that I could ply from the first spun end and also distribute the singles evenly. And unfortunately, it didn't really work that well this time. So even though I had weighed each bobbin and made sure they were all even and so on and so forth. Um, I ended up with two weaving bobbins that had quite a bit of yarn left on them, quite a bit of singles left on them. So I will actually pull them out one day after Nora's settled at school and I'm just going to ply them off as a two ply or I might chain ply them and um, they'll just be a little sample and I'll throw them into something. Yeah, when you've got a lot of twist in the yarn, there's not that room for the fibers to really poof up and fill the space in the you because you've kind of squished out a lot of the air. So even though when I was even though I spun short backward and the yarn is a little bit airier than it would have been if I had spun short forward and really smoothed the fibers every time and your short forward is always going to be smoother and have less air than your short backward, even if you don't smooth really super firmly and super hard. Your short backward is always going to be a little bit more airy, a little bit more inconsistent, even if to the naked eye you can't see it. And it's always going to be a little bit more fuzzy, just like ever so slightly. Just do two samples. Do one small sample that's short forward and then do a short for, short backward and just wind the singles onto a card and look at them side by side. I did this six, um, experiment, if you will, with my friend Kim McKenna. And uh, it was actually quite, quite an eye-opener to see that. Um, and to work through that with her because I was sort of like oh yeah like there's a little bit of a difference but there can't be that much it, there is actually quite a bit big difference but because I put in also a lot of twist into this so there's a lot of twist in the singles there was a lot of twist in the plying um, and even though some of that twist relaxed a little bit like if we use our my new little spin card from uh, Dreaming Robots my twist on here is still about 40 degrees so let me just find a high contrast one here Yeah, the twist is still about 40 degrees. It's 40, 40 degrees. Sorry, the light's uh, blaring on this because this is laminated. Anyways, um, so, and when I was plying, I was plying to about 50 degrees because I knew that it would relax a little bit in the bath, which is exactly what happened. And the skein twisted on itself about four times like this when it came off the wheel. And so it's balanced now um, after washing and a lot of that twist dissipating in the water, but it doesn't have that same poof factor. So, um, but it's still really, really nice. It's a strong yarn. Um, it's got a nice elasticity. Um, and it's got that nice twist in it. It's even, um, it's very, it's spun very consistently. And um, it's going to make a really nice yarn. This yarn actually, so this skein is about 500 yards. So it's spun too finely for the shifty, or sorry, for the shift, yeah, shifty, shifty, the pullover, the, the sweater that I want to do um, by Andrea Mowry. It's too fine for that, but this is the yarn that I want to spin for it, but just a little bit thicker. So... Um, I'm, uh, I, I actually have already started that spin and we'll talk about it on the next episode because hopefully I'll have spun a little bit more by then and you guys will actually have like, be able, I'll be able to show you a sample. So our neighbors are just pulling out. So this afternoon we're doing a year and a summer and barbecue this afternoon with all of our, with our cul-de-sac. I've told you guys about our cul-de-sac before our cul-de-sac's crazy and, um, we're all best friends and it's totally incestuous and crazy. Um, anyways, the lovely just amazing people and so one of my neighbors one of my best friends um she's organized she said to us like let's do a year-end barbecue blah, blah blah so we were all like absolutely and so this was we want to do it on labor day weekend so it's on this weekend because in here it's a long weekend for us so we have mike's not off but normally he would be 
And um, so today we made sure everybody was free. Nobody's going away this weekend, blah, 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 blah. And then we found out that she's organized this big scavenger hunt in our vehicles, in and around where we live. Apparently it'll take us about an hour and we're mixing up who's in vehicles. So I'm one of the drivers apparently because I needed to know that because of the car seat issue. But I'm one of the drivers and then we've got one adult, so two adults and two kids per vehicle. So it'd be really fun. Um, I'm just going to close the door because my family just walked in. I sent them off or they uh, went off on a wild, wild goose chase for stuff. So it'd be really, really fun. Um, I measure yardage before and after finishing so I can see how much it poofs up. Yeah. So this, um, before washing was, um, about 520 yards, 530 yards. And now it's about 498 yards post finishing. So I didn't lose a lot of yardage, but I didn't gain a lot of poof. Um, which I kind of figured. All right. Poofage. I'll be using that word from now on. <laughs> Poofage quo quotient. Oh my goodness, you guys are hilarious. Um, if you're watching this later and you're wondering what I'm talking about, please look in the live chat that's at the upper right hand corner if you're watching on a desktop or a laptop. And if you're watching on a mobile device, please go and look at the, at, at the poofage quotient. Oh my goodness, you guys are so funny. All right, so... Yeah, I, <laughs> incestuous is maybe not the right word, but like our kids, like we all kind of like, everybody has kids and so, and they're all roughly the same age and I, there's a few teenagers, but they're just amazing, amazing teenagers. If my kids end up even a fraction of what they're like, I, I, I will call that a win. Anyways, the kids are constantly going in, in and out of each other's homes and it's not so bad that us moms are always going in and out of each other's homes, but sometimes like I'll be cooking dinner and then I'll, the house will be super noisy and the kids will all be in our house and all of a sudden it's silent and you're sort of like, uh oh, like where are the kids? What are they doing? Did they break something? Are they into something? And then you go and look and they're not in the house anymore. They're all in Sadie's house or they're all in Linnea's house and it's just like, <laughs> they're just really funny. So I mean it in the sense of like, there's definitely some boundaries that get crossed with the kids. All right, so that's that. Um, did you rewind it on a Nitty Naughty after? I actually use a skein winder. So my dad, um, he actually made me a skein winder about a year ago. And it's a two-yard skein winder. And uh, I actually need Mike to modify it a little bit because it's it works really well on the table. So I need him to cut, I need Mike to cut off the stand part because originally we had made it so that it would go onto the table like this and like clamp on. But I don't need that part anymore. So I need Mike to take that off but I use a two yard two yard um, skein winder and they you know I use too slow for me for um, winding like a 500 yard skein so all right you guys can keep chatting and ask questions and I'm just going to uh, carry on um, okay so I talked about this before this is the spark of gray by Melanie Berg um, I stumbled on this pattern I talked about it on the podcast last time I Stumble on this pattern because I wanted to use up, or not use up, but I wanted to knit with my spin cycle yarn. And I, um, oh, I'm in the middle of a row. Darn. I hate that when that happens when I'm on the pod, when I were on the podcast, because then it's really hard to show you. Anyways, I got a whole bunch of it done the last couple of, over the last week. But I had started this because I thought that I maybe would need something for working on in the hospital when my dad was sick. And of course that ended up not happening because he uh, he didn't make it. Um, but I, I, I think last time when I talked to you guys, I was sort of like here um, from the cast on edge. So the cast on edge is here. And it's been, it's really slow because every, every, every row has something to do. And so I'm finding this a really slow, laborious knit. Um, and I've kind of lovingly started to refer to this as, as my dad's shawl. Um, I'm looking forward to wearing this cause I love these colors and this is the spin cycle mill ends that I told you about. So this is the yarn. I still have a ways to go and it's a three ply. It's spun very similarly to the one that I just showed you. I used to spin every single skein that way. It was a three ply, light fingering, high twist, blah, blah, blah. Like it's really only been in the last couple of years, especially you guys, um, sort of forcing me to spin lots of different stuff so that I can help you guys. And 
one, inspire you guys and motivate you and blah, 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 blah. So the, um, this is very like typical of the yarns that I spun a lot of from like 2014 through to about 2016, 2017. And um, I'm really enjoying working with it. It's a really nice yarn. It's going to really work well structurally in this shawl if I end up wearing it a ton, um, which I kind of suspect that I will. And um, the colors are really quite lovely. And the camera's missing some of the nuances of the color. Like you can't really see all of the different colors in here and all the different, it kind of just comes up as, as light striping and almost like a, like a, yeah, like a sort of a striping yarn, but actually in real life, it, there's a lot more nuance and a lot more interest in the colors. But on the camera, of course, it picks up the most dominant color, but it's labor intensive. So I worked on it a lot yesterday because we were sitting around visiting so much with my brother and sister-in-law and I worked on it a lot the day before because we were sitting outside and visiting and um, just drinking coffee and stuff. So I, um, yeah, it's, it's a very labor intensive shawl. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to keep working in this pattern until this is gone. And then I'll finish out the border, which is a it's like a six by two rib or something like that um, with the remainder of this. And that'll stash bust some of my yarn, um, some of my commercial yarn and um, use it up. So, cause I have tons of it. Um, so yeah, really pretty. Yeah, it's funny. Kelly was saying, I seriously love the way that hand spun looks in that shawl. It's beautiful. Yeah, thank you, Kelly. I agree with you. I, I think this type of a pattern where you have, because it's called Sparks of Grey. So these are meant to sort of be sparks, right? And I, I sort of love, I, I think of this as Sparks of Grampy. Um, but I think that part of the reason why it works and why the hand spun works with this pattern is because I kept the main color the solid neutral so you could use gray or black or white or brown or as long as it's a solid it, it'll work with whatever you put with it because I left that front and center so that the sparks themselves are still that white yarn whatever color you choose the color behind the 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 second color can change and like this would work really well as a gradient so if you had a gradient yarn and it slowly changed as the as the, the shawl was knit, um, that would work really super well. But as long as you have that consistency and this, the sparks aren't the ones that are changing color, it's gonna work. Um, and patterns like this are hard to come by because sometimes there's just too much texture on the knit and on the fabric. So then it takes away from what the yarn has to offer. Because when I cast this on back here, the way I read the pattern, because I read it wrong because I was in the midst of grieving um, and being really worried, the um, I thought that this white here turned into the background color and that my hand spun would be the sparks. And so I misread the pattern, but now I'm really, and so I was really bummed. Like I got to like, I don't know, one or two rows in and I was like, ah, oh, that's not what I wanted. I wanted it the opposite. But the thing is, is that it works. So even though the hand spun isn't kind of quote unquote front and center in the sparks and the hand spun is literally kind of behind the, 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 the sparks and the main color, um, that's why it works. So I'm glad that I kind of misread the pattern and made that mistake. Because the other thing too is you have these center stitches running up here. And if those were constantly changing color because you carry this center stitch, you you... You keep slipping it every time you have a your two rows of your contrast color. So you carry it up like over three or four rows and then you have the one row where you just have, you don't end up having to carry it multiple rows and then you have it carried for multiple rows again. So that would end up being the wrong color. It wouldn't be this color, it would actually be this color. So this, I hope I'm explaining this in a way that you guys can follow. If I put this a bit closer for you, if this slipped stitch here, because it's going over multiple rows, 
it would actually be the color from down here, not the color from up here. So you would end up carrying it and it would be the wrong color in that stripe. Does that make sense? So I'm actually really glad that I made the mistake and that I ended up with the white because it looks more harmonious. So yeah, very cool. So one day I'll finish this. I am working on it monogamously. I don't have any other projects on the needles right now. This is the only thing and it's slow. And I'm a fast knitter, you guys know that. So um, yeah, it is taking a long time. But you know, sometimes it's nice to really get deep into a project, you know? Like sometimes it's nice to have that more complicated project and that more complicated knit. Because I find sometimes um, that's not necessarily what happens. Like sometimes I end up with a project that is a little bit less, um, that's a little bit less, it's a little bit more mindless and a little bit less engaging. And so to have a project like that is actually kind of nice. Um, it's not taxing on my head or on my brain. So, um, oh, chain plying on a spindle. There's a couple of really good YouTube videos, Kelly. Mm. That's a good question, Claudia. What's the name of that stitch? I actually am not sure. Let me have a look. Yeah, it's ply on the fly. That's right, uh, Charlotte. She doesn't say in the pattern what it's called. I only printed out part of the pattern though because I only printed out the um, the repeat because um, I'm just going to knit until I run out of the Spin Cycle Mill Ends hand spun. She just says stitch definitions section one. And that's it. She doesn't actually call it anything. So I don't know. It's probably from some knit dictionary somewhere. So if you have access to knit dictionaries, have a look. Um, okay, let's have a look at what we've got going on now. Uh, oh, I calculated the grist of that um, Smith and You yarn that seems to have disappeared. Where did I put it? Oh, here. Um, it's uh, 2,300 yards per pound, which is crazy. So... It's 100 grams, 500 yards. Yeah. Um, there's a bunch of housekeeping. If you're curious, we talked about the Patreon tiers at the beginning of the show. If you're curious and you want access to the ebook, the hard copy of our book, um, Unbraided, um, please have a look in the show notes at wealthofpearls.com or at. Um, funny how this washes out the camera. The camera auto immediately tries to compensate for the brightness of the book. Um, have a look at wellforpearls.com, craftyjacks.ca in the store. You can order the hard copy. And if you want an ebook copy, um, have a look at the show notes. The link is there. It is working. Um, somebody very kindly messaged me and let me know that it, actually the, the link wasn't working. And I um, have fixed it. Um, our Maker Mornings our three year anniversary celebration that we had through June, July and August are done. They are all posted and you can watch them now that they're up and um, are there uh, for patrons. And if you want to see those become a regular part of what we do here at Woolen Spinning, tell your friends, get them to pledge. We need to pop up to 300 members in our community and we're so close. So um, I hope that you will consider even just a dollar a month. It makes a huge difference. When you look at Patreon, anybody's Patreon, it doesn't matter who it is, whether it's me or somebody else, it does, anybody. If you see in the pledge tiers that the numbers aren't what you want to pledge, you can click on it. So click on like say the $5 per month one. If you don't wanna pledge $5 a month, you click on that and say join $5 tier. And then you change, when you get to the landing page, you can change how much you pledge per month. So like if a dollar a month is what you want to pledge because you want access to the uh, teaching content and you want access to the maker mornings but you don't necessarily want to have access to anything else or you want to have access to these live streams and you don't just want to watch them later um, when they're aired for everybody uh, and that's all you can do in a dollar a month is all all you feel like you want to pledge 
you can go in there and adjust that $5 and put it down to one or two or three. And that's totally fine. It's just every little bit helps. And you know, when people are creating content and they're making stuff and they're podcasting or they're putting out their, their work as an artist or whatever, every little bit helps. And, um, you know, it's, um, it's entertainment for you and it, yeah, it just, it really makes a big difference for all of these creators that you, we all want to see continue on and to be there in the future. So please think about that and remember that like if you pledge for me or if you pl pledge for Grace Shalom Hopkins or like whoever you, you know, support Beth Smith, there's so many people out there that are, that are um, using this to help to, for them to be able to continue to work as artists and uh, content makers and podcasters and all that different stuff. You can pledge how much you want to pledge per month. The pledge tiers are not set in stone it just it's the maker's way of organizing people and and organizing the rewards if you will but that doesn't mean that you have to pledge five dollars a month two dollars a month three dollars a month doesn't matter so um do keep that in the back of your mind because a lot of people don't know that that's how patreon works and that the pledge tiers are just the creator's way of keeping things organized and of uh, and offering rewards um so if you pledge a dollar a month you get access to all the to the teaching content vlog every month and you get access to wool and spinning radio and you get access to these live streams and to maker morning so just something to think about because i think people sometimes don't realize um am i being dense are there before photos of the braids you're spinning for the book uh the braids themselves are all photographed throughout the book yeah absolutely eve the cover is the braids before they were spun um, and actually I can grab the book. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to slam my, so if you look at the back of the book, that's one of the braids. That's one of the braids. That's one of the braids. That's one of the semi-solids. This is the three waters farm. This is nest fibers. One of the braids from the book. This is another three waters farm. And on the front, these two ones on the end, they're both the semi-solids. And that's, uh, this, these two are nest fiber arts and this one's the, th one of the three waters farm. So there were two nest. So this is them spun afterward. Um, and then three waters farm. So that was them spun afterward. So if you look at the colors on those pages and you look at the colors in the, in the yarns and, and, um, in the samples, and then you look at the front, oh yeah, that's that one. Oh yeah, that's that one. And they're photographed throughout the book. Like they're all here. Um, so yeah, good question, Eve. Um, yes, thank you for making this show, Rachel. I love watching your podcast. After watching for a year, I knew I had to start supporting. Thank you so much, Claudia. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I think there's value. You know, there's value to what all of these people are doing. And the handmade community, there's there's a lot of people that um, do this full time. And, uh, you know, we have to really be aware of that and, and make sure that we're giving opportunities to people who uh, maybe don't have some of the uh, advantages that other people have. Um and we need to be aware of that and, and to fund people and to to uh, to recognize that there's value in this edutainment sort of um, um, industry. So it's not just in the handmade community. It's in the tech sector and in the tech podcasts. It's in photography. It's everywhere, everywhere. So just think about that. Um, yeah, I always have tons of issues. <laughs> Charlotte's like, or Claudia's like, and you're explaining issues you had. Yeah, I always have a ton of issues. <laughs> I always have stuff that goes wrong, stuff that I planned it and I like put everything in place and then it all goes sideways. Like I just, I don't know. I said to Felicia, we had coffee earlier this week together and the kids had a really good play and we were chatting about like taking back Friday and Sweet Georgia and you know, wool and spinning all that stuff. Cause my, my content and the workshops that I've developed for Sweet Georgia, they're all going to air in, within the next two months. And so I've seen a bunch of it and we were talking about it and I was like, I always have issues. <laughs> She's like, yeah, yeah, you kind of do. <laughs> I was like, I don't know. You know what I think it is? It's because I do a lot of my making when the kids are around. So I'm like girl interrupted. My friend Melissa always uses that phrase. She calls, she says, oh yeah, yeah, totally girl interrupted. And um, capital G, capital I. And I think that's actually really what it is. I get interrupted a ton. So um, yeah, it's just, it's an issue. Okay, weaving. Let's talk about weaving. Um, 
this is our final segment of the show. It's something that um, is sort of new to the show. So we've got like our works in progress. We've got our, our um, you know, finished objects. We've got like, you know, um, eventually we'll have a little bit of sewing. But now we have a regular weaving pro podcast. So this came off of my LeClaire compact. Um, I'm going to switch the cameras because it is so big that I'm going to have to be able to show you. So I'm just going to get rid of the cam, or sorry, I don't want to get rid of me. Um, this thing is huge and it's not been finished yet. It just came off the loom yesterday. I took it off. Um, it was ready to come off after, uh, before we went to Victoria, but I actually ended up taking it off last night because I had to hem stitch the last end. So while Mike was putting the kids to bed, um, I hem, hem stitched the end and, um, pulled it off. So the one end is actually all fringed. It's all done. This is all done. It's two, two strands. I've already, I've already hem stitched or sorry, uh, fringe twisted. Um, uh, I did it, I did it uh, with my fringe twister because it, there, I made my fringes quite long on this. So they're seven inches. So I decided, and because I was do, only doing two strands at a time, which I'll show you at the other end. Um, this thing's huge. Um, I did my fringe twister of I, I did four at a time and then that gave me the two finished two finished uh, fringes. So it actually sped it up a little bit. So if you can see, I, maybe I will use my other camera actually. Thanks for being so patient with me, you guys. Um, okay, so what I did, oh, you know what? I should just change the cameras around. Duh. Okay, so what I did was um, when I did my hem stitching, I'll do the white because maybe is the white easier to see? Can you guys tell me? Um, <sighs> but crafting is interrupting parenting, so it's one of the built-in quote-unquote issues. You're so right, Diane. Um, I love your wisdom. Um, okay, so this is white. So I, I hem stitched two at a time. So there's two strands per hem stitching because I thought about doing four but it just was too thick at eight eight ends per inch it was just too thick so I um did two at a time and then so I, I'm twisting on the fringe twister I can tw twist these four all at once oh my gosh <laughs> just won't come um, I can twist all four of these at once and then that's two fringes done. So actually last night I had some tea and Mike and I were seeing, we had to talk about a bunch of stuff and we were just kind of debriefing about a bunch of things. And that meant that I could um, sit and fringe twist. So I'll show you how big this thing is. And yeah, the webcam doesn't focus very well. It, uh, it really takes a long time. So I did two... This is point twill. So you can really see it in the white sections. And this is not washed. And you can see, because I was getting used to the loom, because it's my very first project, I was beading quite a bit tighter for this first about, it's about three inches. And then I kind of loosened up and found my rhythm and got used to the beater. And um, I had to change yarns. So I ran out of the gray um, that I was using, the gray Jacob. So you can see that the um, the color of the weft changes. You can see that striping in there. So I actually used, there was the gray Jacob and then I also used some Romney, uh, Romney mohair from Diz Darrow Ranch that was a gray that I had spun a few years ago. So like I said, this is really long and after I finish it, I'm actually gonna use it as the on the end of our bed because it's like more than long enough. It's too big to wear. It's just way too big. I could sew it and make it into like a wrap, like I could sew it down here and make it, but like it's on the ground. Like it's just too big, I'm not tall enough. And I could cut it apart and I could make like pillows, but I kind of want it on the end of our bed. So I'm going to put it because our quilt is uh, browns and greens and reds and golds. And my mom made it for us when we got married. So um, 
It's a little bit wavy. I think I'm hoping that'll come out in the wash. But that is uh, that's that's that. Pretty cool, huh? Um, it's it, it's huge. <laughs> it is huge. Um, yeah, it's a bit too too much. Um, oh, that's good, Claudia. The color change would not even have no been noticed if you hadn't pointed out. Yeah, it, I just ran out of yarn. Like it just um. It took way more weft than I thought that it would. And when I made the four yard warp, I didn't kind of realize quite how long it was, but it also meant that I could leave quite a long fringe. So um, when I ran out of the Disdero, I had the apron rod. It had come over the back of the loom, but I wasn't quite at the end of the warp. I could have probably woven a good another 12 inches. And I just thought, you know what, I'm done. I'm just gonna hem stitch it, use the yarn that I have. It means I don't have to delve into my stash anymore. And I can be done. And actually, if you guys want, um, because this this is long today. This is what I thought was going to happen last time. We we're going to have this really super long show, and then we kind of ended up not. Ended up not, um, which is kind of funny. It's funny how that happens. Um, these are the yarns that I used for it. I have my sewing scissors out to cut it off the back because I wanted like really sharp, good yarn, good scissors. So. These aren't all of the yarns that are in it because I had to, um, unfortunately, I had to, um, hang on. Um, I actually used up some of them. Like they're in the, they're in the, I don't know what, what I'm going to call it, but they're in it. And um, I, I used them all up. So this is some two ply Shetland that I spun for a vest a few years ago. This is my four ply Falkland. There was a hand carded um, neppy. I made that um, featherweight cardigan with the uh, lace panel from Vermont in the back. Um, I still wear that thing all the time. I actually often wear it with this shirt actually in the winter. This is my four ply crossbreed local wool from my lemongrass pullover. And then this is some overspun two ply BFL that was a sample that I did for something and I didn't like the yarn at all. And I, I used up almost all of it in the, whatever I'm gonna call that thing. So the natural, I'm calling it the natural stole. I also have some meat merino two ply Suffolk cross that was from my fireside um, that got used up completely in this. And there's my hand combed Tunis that I never used in another project um, that I threw in there. And then there's the Jacob and the Romney, Romney mohair blend yarn. I think that was everything. So it's all naturals except for this one. This is the only one that has, has um, any kind of dye on it, um, but it's natural. It kind of, it just works. So yeah. That's going to be so warm to curl up and you know what Claudia that, or uh, Kelly that's actually a really good idea or a good point because actually um if I put it on the end of our bed it's like a what are those called when you have those like um things on the end of your beds um I can't remember what they're called but then it's there and you can pull it and wrap it around yourself when you're sitting there in bed because in the evening I often sit and have a cup of tea and like do some knitting or I write my journal or I read or whatever um and usually on the nights that Mike's either late um with work or he's gone to the gym or he's doing stuff so that's actually really cool because it would be sitting there and i could use it um ends per inch and dents per inch so or uh dent uh right read okay so i ended up weaving it at eight ends per inch so i actually have an eight dent read for this loom so i that's actually why i chose it um <laughs> i didn't check my wraps per inch i didn't do any other stuff i knew these were all worsted weight um, I didn't want to go any less than eight ends per inch because I was worried about how it would full and the denseness of the fabric and whatnot. Um, and so, yeah, eight ends per inch and uh, the, I have a, and it's an eight dent read and I, I just slayed it one, one per, per thing. So what Megan and I are talking about is on looms, weaving looms, you thread your heddles um, and you thread your heddles one thread goes through each heddle. So if it's a four shaft pattern, you're going to be threading up to a certain pattern, a certain threading pattern through one heddle. The heddle is, are these little things, one, one of these heddles through whichever shaft in the pattern that's called for in the weaving pattern, if you're using a pattern. So with this one, I was, I was threading 
Shaft one, two, three, four, three, two, one, two, three, four, three, two, one, two, three, four. So it made like this diamond pattern in my heddles. But then you have to slay your reed. So your reed is in your beater. And that is how you get your, um, how many threads per inch. So for this one, I had an eight dent reed. So that means eight um, slots per inch. And I had one thread through each. So I was weaving at eight ends per inch. So over an inch, I have eight threads. And so then you weave, for this, I was doing a balanced weave. So then I was weaving eight and uh, picks per inch, which is your weft. So when you measure your weft over an inch, you have eight threads going this way and you have eight warp threads going this way. So if I was doing, let's say I was doing um, place mats and I was weaving with four eight cotton, which is a, um, a double thickness compared to two eight cotton and two eight cotton is like a fabric like this for tea towels, two eight cotton. But let's say I was doing something with four eight cotton and I wanted to weave like place mats or rug coasters or something. And I wanted to weave quite, quite a dense fabric. I could slay my reed at 16 ends per inch so that I would have two threads per slot on my rattle. So it's this eight dent reed and I want to slay it at 16 ends per inch. So I would put two threads through each slot and that would give me 16 threads per inch. And that would be 16 ends per inch. So it's your reed that dictates what your, your measurement is going to be of your cloth. So when you're slaying your reed, you have to know like where the middle of your reed is and then you kind of work from you, you measure it like this was a full 24 inches. So I just started at one end and I thread it all the way across. But if I was doing something that was like 10 inches, I would find the, the, the middle and then I would start slaying five inches from the middle and slay across. And you, by the, by the time you finish slaying, you'll have 10 inches of width for your cloth because you're threading say six, two per dent, 16 ends per inch and that gives you your whatever. Um, so based on your threads and how many threads you have, that will give you your weaving width. But where you actually do that is in your reed. It's not in your heddles. I think a lot of people think that that happens in your heddles and it doesn't, it happens in your reed. So this loom, this lady that I bought it from had an eight dent reed, a 10 dent reed, and a 12 dent reed that goes with this loom. So she um, included it in the cost to let me have all three reads because she doesn't need them because she's moving and she's getting rid of everything. So, and what are you, what would you say your wraps, your yarn? So the yarn varied. So this was probably the thickest yarn. Um, it's, it was about, um, nine wraps per inch. And this one was one of the thinner ones. And it's probably about 10 or 11, maybe, maybe 12 wraps per inch, probably more like 10 or 11. So because I had some variety, I kind of just had to like pick a number and stick with it and hope that it worked out. But these were all worsted weight yarns roughly. So based on my experience, so one of the um, things that kind of had happened was I wove that, um, it was that llama uh, roving that was mixed with the silk and it had that sort of yellowish color and the yellow, when I washed it, it ran into the llama fibers and I wove that blanket stole thing. And um, I did it at five ends per inch and it wasn't a dense enough weave. I should have done it at like seven and a half or eight ends per inch. And I did it, it was one of my last projects on my rigid heddle. And um, the yarn was very similarly spun to all of these yarns. And so that's actually part of the reason why I did what I did. Because I thought I, if I go down, um, I'm going to have too open of a, of a cloth. And I was so disappointed with how open that ended up weaving at. Knowing what I know now, I might actually pull that out and refinish it. Because I don't think I fold it enough. Um... So I need to think about how I'm going to tackle that because I might actually redo it. All right. Yeah, good score on the extra reads. reads the reads themselves were $60 each if, if she had asked me to pay them, her for them. So um, I showed these on the last podcast, but I just wanted to fit, uh, share with you. I actually did get them hemmed and got them finished. So these are 2-8 uh, cotton. They're woven at um, 18 ends per inch. 
and um, they turned out really well. I'm not sure what I'm going to do with them. Um, they're not really my colors and they're certainly not the colors of my kitchen. I'm like, where'd the other ones go? Oh, they're on my lap. But uh, they turned out really, really well. And I, I used some um, thread from my sewing stash to get them to get them hemmed. And they uh, turned out really nicely. So they're all hemmed, ready to go. They'll either be gifts or... Um, I might actually give them to my mom because her kitchen, um, even though she would like to redo the kitchen at first because her and my dad had actually organized to have it renoed this summer and then they put a hold on everything. Um, if she carries through, these won't be the colors in that kitchen any longer. But at this point, these are the colors in the kitchen. So I may actually give these to my mom. So now that I have talked about them on the podcast and I've done, I think I've written a blog post about them or I'm going to anyways, they're all photographed. Um, I probably will give them to my mom. So that is those. The other thing that I wanted to just touch on, this will be done next time, is that I borrowed a frame loom from my friend Felicia when we were over there earlier this week. That's actually why I was going over there was to pick this thing up because we'd forgotten it on the day that we picked up the floor loom. Um, so this is actually a little project that I'm working on. Um, it's actually for the 51 yarns spin along that we're doing in the Ravelry group and in the teaching content for Patreon because I... Um, it's on singles next month. So energize singles, thin singles, and thick and thin. And, or not thin, uh, soft singles. Soft singles, thick and thin, and energize. And uh, I wanted to show what some of those look like when they're woven, because they're some of my favorite. When you see them in other people's um, little weaving projects, um, I love what they look like woven. So I started this the other night. So this is just the fringe at the bottom that I thought that I would throw on. I have to trim it a little bit. And then uh, I'm going to start building my little picture. So just something fun, something different. You know, it's just a variety. All right. Um, I'm warping today eight ends per inch with hand spun at 11 wraps per inch. Oh, Charlotte, you'll have to share with us in the Slack channel what they end up looking like. Um, those towels make me want to loom. Oh, San, I know. That's what happened to me. So, you know, you see all these tea towels on Instagram. And the more I saw them, the more I was like, I want to, I want to weave. <laughs> I want to do that. So um, I suspect there are going to be a lot of tea towels in my future. But part of it, too, has been working out. So these were woven at 17 and a half ends per inch, if I'm being totally honest. They weren't fully 18 ends per inch, but they've made like this really lovely drapey fabric. And um, that's actually what uh, I wanted to sort of do a little bit of an experiment with, with this little three yard warp with these towels, because I um, I had got the th two, two eight cotton for the woven top that I wanted to do. And um, I wanted to see how it wove because everybody raves about 2.8 cotton at 18 ends per inch. Jane Stafford talks about it a lot in her online guild. And I've got friends that only weave 2.8 cotton at, at 18 ends per inch for towels. And I thought, I wonder if that fabric would be right for what I'm looking for, for this top that I want to make. And sure enough, it's just beautiful. So that is something we'll be talking about on the wool stream. I will not become a weaver. I will not become a weaver. Oh, yes, you will, Diane. <laughs> One day. <laughs> All right, we've had a really big show and uh, it's been a long time. I've kept you guys here for a long time. I so appreciate your time and um, appreciate you spending it with me. Um, happy Saturday morning. I hope you've had a wonderful summer and uh, that you've got lots of memories and happiness. And for those who are in the Southern Hemisphere and are entering into their spring right now, I hope you've had a good winter and I hope that it hasn't been too horrible. For those who are in the Southern USA um, with the impending hurricane, um, I hope that you're safe and that things are okay where you are and that um, you guys have the systems in place to deal with it because I know this is that going into this season is always uh, really challenging for different parts of the world. So um, um, we always get really bit bad wind storms here and lots of rain and um, yeah, just stay safe, everyone. So have a wonderful Labor Day weekend if you're um, enjoying that. And uh, happy back to school next week and last week and last couple weeks for those who are heading back to school. And uh, until next time, happy spinning. Bye, guys. Thank you so much. I will uh, see you next time. Bye.